what if we were to tell you that Wales actually had five professional rugby teams? If you're clued up on rugby, you may be familiar with the Scarlets, Ospreys, Dragons and Cardiff, but what many people don't know is there was actually a fifth Welsh region. The Celtic Warriors were a one-season wonder, the product of amalgamation, compromise and patching up. They might have been a flash in the pan on the pitch, but even 20 years down the line, their impact off it has seen ramifications even to this very day. From grassroots debates over a pint in the local clubhouse, all the way through to multi-million pound negotiations in the ivory towers at the Principality Stadium, people still talk about the void left behind by the Celtic Warriors. The professional valley side that was deleted by the WRU after just one season. Stick around for this one. It's a story of battle and betrayal that defined an entire generation of rugby fans. I'm Benny from Catch-22 Rugby, and we look at the rise and fall of the Celtic Warriors. Before we kick things off, it's probably worth laying out the land of club rugby in Wales. Unlike countries such as England and France, Wales doesn't have a professional club system. When rugby union went professional in the mid to late 90s, Wales struggled to find a structure that would best suit the nation. To start off with, the original leading clubs at the time took matters into their own hands and adopted professional status for themselves. Clubs like Cardiff, Llanelli, Newport, Bridgend and Pontypridd all took the initiative and went pro to keep with the times. It became apparent that this wasn't going to work. Wales is quite a small country, so having 10 to 12 pro clubs wouldn't be sustainable. With limited player pools, finances, supporters and infrastructure, the majority of clubs couldn't sustain themselves, and if they could, they wouldn't be able to keep up with the competition in England, France and Ireland, for example. Just as we've seen in modern times with the unfortunate downfalls of Wasps and Worcester, spending beyond your means isn't too wise in rugby. As Wales stalled on the pro debate, the Welsh national game began to stutter. A humiliating 96-13 loss to South Africa was a massive wake-up call to many that showed how far Wales had fallen behind its peers. While the clubs continued with the day-to-day, -day, the WRU under the guise of David Moffat came up with an apparent solution – regional rugby. Adopting a similar system to the All Blacks in New Zealand, the pro game in Wales would be serviced by geographical areas rather than individual clubs. On paper, the idea was simple. Clubs would merge their players and resources together to create super teams, putting aside all rivalries to create competitive teams to challenge on the European stage. The idea that successful sides with united infrastructures would see successful products come up the ranks for Team Wales. It's worth noting that the regional rugby saga is an incredibly complex story full of controversy, dispute, legal battles and power struggles. And while we will be looking to do a video on this further down the line, this video for the sake of my sanity will not be going into the full details of regional rugby. All you need to know is this, Wales would be served by five professional sides. Representing the capital city of Cardiff, the Cardiff Blues, although they just go by Cardiff these days. Representing Newport and the Gwent Valley, the Newport Gwent Dragons, known simply today as Dragons RFC. Representing Swansea and West Glamorgan, the Swansea Neath Ospreys, who after a bit of a rebrand became just the Ospreys. And representing West Wales and the north of the country, the Flanelli Scarlets, or just Scarlets as they go by these days. The fifth region was to serve the heartlands of the Welsh Valleys and Bridgend, the Celtic Warriors. While debate and argument over the structure rattled the higher-ups for many years in rugby, an eventual decision was made by the early noughties, and come 2003, Wales would have five pro regions playing in the now United Rugby Championship, known back then as the Celtic League or Pro 12. The Celtic Warriors were an interesting concept from the very beginning. Just like the Ospreys, who were emerging of the historical clubs of Swansea and Neath, Celtic Warriors were also the product of merging with Bridgend and Pontypridd coming together under one banner. Both Bridgend and Ponzi had rich histories within Welsh rugby, vocal and passionate fan bases, and both had a track record of producing top quality local players. It's at this point we have to introduce one of the most influential characters within the Celtic Warriors story, Leighton Samuel. Leighton had been the man behind Bridgend Ravens, using his wealth within the frame construction industry, he bankrolled Bridgend to the 2003 Welsh title. When the regional rugby discussion landed on his desk, the Pontypridd merger with Bridgend was on. There were some struggles and compromises from the start. Initially dubbed the Valley's Ravens, Samuel & Co. pitched the idea to the WRU, who rejected the name on marketing grounds. Next up on the naming list, the Celtic Crusaders, this time being rejected by the fans themselves. Eventually, Celtic Warriors was decided as the option that received the least amount of backlash. The logo would consist of two features, the famous Bridgend Raven, layered on Ponty's old bridge upon Glamorgan Chevrons. Club colours, the black and white to Ponty, mixed with Bridgend Blue. The stadium situation would also prove problematic. Sardis Road of Pont de Paris and the brewery of Bridgend both had pros and cons. The facilities at Bridgend had superior changing rooms, bars, kitchens and hospitality rooms, while the famous House of Pain at Sardis Road had the numbers, atmosphere and reputation as a tough ground to visit. There were no other viable stadium options within the immediate area. 
the compromise, games would be split between both grounds to accommodate both sets of fans. As a side note, it's worth noting that although Bridgend and Ponty are only 11 miles apart, bad geography and transport links mean the journey is around 40 minutes by car or 90 minutes by train. On the plus side, there was one aspect of the merger that appealed to all, the playing squad. A side littered with outstanding talents, Neil Jenkins and Gareth Althe Thomas were the two marquee superstars that would link up. Together with the likes of Sonny Parker, Gareth Cooper, Mevin Davis, Brent Cobain and Robert Sadoli, the Warriors side would be stacked. The future was also set as well, with the youngsters like Matthew Reese, Ryan Jones, Gethin Jenkins and Ian Evans all of the region, all of whom were going to become internationals and eventual Lions tourists, the pinnacle of rugby in the British Isles. With everything just about set behind the scenes, the brave new world of regional rugby kicked off in September 2003. The Warriors began life in the Celtic League strong. An opening win in the Scottish borders looked promising, as Warriors put nearly 50 points on the board. This promise was doubled down with their first ever home game, a Sardis Road victory against Leinster, beating the Irish 29 points to 22. In fact, as rugby goes, the Celtic Warriors were quite successful for an overnight team. Under the guidance of head coach Lynn Howells, Warriors finished up their first campaign with a fourth place finish in the league. In Europe, Warriors had automatically qualified for the Heineken Cup and came very close to a knockout run. Despite finishing second in their group, they narrowly missed out on the quarterfinals by just two points. But they did hold the unofficial title as champion toppers, beating eventual champions Wasps in the group stage, Wasps' only loss in their European campaign. As peachy as pitch performances were, off-pitch wasn't looking so good. The success of a team is often measured by support, and fans talk with their feet. Attendance is made for Hara Reading, averaging merely 2,400 in the league. European ties did bump this overall average to around 3,300, but it was still not enough. With league champion Scarlets averaging around 9,000, the chasm between the standard and reality were apparent for all to see. The low numbers weren't exclusive to either the brewery or Sardis alone, but Leighton Samuel eventually pulled the plug on Sardis Road in Ponty when only 1,500 people turned up for a derby game against the Dragons. Money trouble also reared its ugly head shortly into the Warriors' experiment. On the Valley side, Ponty Preeth were in a pretty bad financial position and it became apparent they couldn't afford professional rugby. Despite previous WU prop-ups of around half a million, Ponty's bank accounts were drying up. The club entered administration. With their 50% in Celtic Warriors now up in the air, Leighton Samuel was the first name on the list of potential buyers. Sure enough, Samuel purchased that 50% stake that Ponty owned in the Celtic Warriors, but rather than keeping it in-house, he gifted it to the WRU. With Ponty out of the picture, the Warriors went Bridgend-centric, losing half of their potential fan base in the process. The Warriors' leak was starting to flood the brewery. Losing tens of thousands of his own cash each month, and with attendances dwindling, the writing was on the wall, Leighton wanted out. He arranged a meeting with the WRU to sell his final 50% share, giving the Welsh Rugby Union complete control over the region. The sale wasn't straightforward. Despite their magnificent riches today, the Welsh Rugby Union weren't as wealthy back in 2004. A significant debt on the Principality Stadium was crippling Welsh income so they couldn't justify buying out a financially failing region. Of all the things to come to their aid, it was the other four regions who would step in. The Osprey Scarlets, Dragons and Cardiff would pull together a total of 1.25 million to buy out the Celtic Warriors. The four would split the Warriors' annual WRU funding between them from here on out and get access to the Warriors' playing squad. Now, this is where the sale becomes a bit tricky. According to Leighton Samuel, he was only willing to sell the club on this condition. The Celtic Warriors would have at least one more season, something he communicated to his staff and players at the time. The WRU, however, said this was never mentioned. This contest would end up in a legal battle with the WRU settling out of court further down the line. With he said, she said squabbles aside, the outcome remained. The Celtic Warriors were liquidated under the WRU ownership, closing down for good. There are quite a few groups that were massively impacted following the Warriors' demise. First up, the players and staff. It's safe to say that the Celtic Warriors people were not happy with this outcome. They'd gone from being reassured of a second season to being told that they were all out of a job. While the jury was still out on who was to blame, a young Ryan Jones certainly had a few strong words on the matter. The then 21-year-old attended a liquidation meeting with the WRU and, according to reports, putting WRU boss Dave Moffat firmly in his place. Quite the feat for a guy not long out of school, but with a future career as a Wales captain, it's not surprising in hindsight. The fallout resulted in a mass auction for talent. One by one, players are brought into meeting rooms at the brewery field and told their fate. To describe the situation, it's best to use a quote from one of the players at the time, Welsh forward Mevin Davis. It was like a cattle market. Brent Cobain went into his meeting and came out saying, there are two clubs interested in me, the Ospreys and someone else. I remember Kevin Morgan had a couple of clubs, but for me, there was nothing. 
Another account spoke of the Tongan international Mama Molatika, one of the hard men of that Celtic warrior side, apparently reduced to tears on the steps of the Grand Stand when no offers came his way. As for the Warriors' marquee signings of Neil Jenkins and Gareth Thomas, well, both luckily avoided this auction fate. Jenkins was going into retirement at the season's end, while Alfie had already secured his future months prior, getting signed by Toulouse before things started to unravel at home. Next up, it's worth talking about Leighton Samuel. Leighton didn't give up on his rugby dream, but took the Warriors' concept away from rugby union. He founded the Welsh Rugby League side, the Celtic Crusaders, at the Brewery Field. The side did make some markers in league and even obtained Super League status by the time 2009 came around. They left Bridgend in 2010 for North Wales, but only one year later, the Crusaders had gone under, and with it, Samuel's apparent interest in running a rugby club. The final point is one of the great controversies that come out of the Celtic Warriors story, the fate of Pontypridd, Bridgend and the four remaining regions, an outcome that's had consequences 20 years down the line, driving conversation and debate on a daily basis. So what would happen to fill the region's void? Simply put, they were bought by their neighbours. Bridgend and Pontypridd still had its original clubs in place following the collapse of the Celtic Warriors. Pontypridd bounced back from administration, while Bridgend reformed without Leighton Samuel in the picture. Both would continue on, but in semi-pro capacities. Wales didn't have room for a new region or a new pro team. The Ospreys to the west came in for the Bridgend area, taking responsibility for the local feeder clubs and youth systems within. With Ospreys referring to themselves as the now one true region, Bridgend was incorporated into Australia alongside Swansea, Neath and Aberavon. The Ospreys would go on to have great success in the following years, becoming arguably one of the most successful Welsh teams to date, winning four titles and producing the Galacticos team of the late noughties. While the Bridgend Ospreys merger seemed more amicable, with the Ospreys even playing some league games at the brewery field, the same couldn't be said for Pont de Brie. The region to take responsibility for the Valley's void, their greatest rivals, Cardiff. Pont de Brie and Cardiff had shared a long lasting rivalry spanning the decades prior to regional rugby. In a Valley's Boy versus City Slicker narrative, barriers between the pair ran deep. The remnants of the Ponty fan base were not okay with this merger. While the infrastructure aspects of this merger seemed to work fine, with many Valley's talents coming through the pathway system and eventually going pro in Cardiff, it's safe to say that sentiments north of the M4 has been anything but rosy. If you fancy finding out for yourself, try heading into Pont de Paris Town Centre with a Cardiff rugby top on and send me your thoughts on how it went. While some still yearn for professional rugby to return to the old Warriors region, it seems the ship has set sail. The four remaining regions have enjoyed varying degrees of success in the past 20 years, but as of the post-COVID landscape, the regional model seems to be stuttering. Attendances are falling, money is drying up, and despite contributing heavily to Wales' new golden age with Six Nation titles and Grand Slams galore, the parallels between the four and the old Celtic Warriors are starting to look more similar. As stated earlier in this video, we'll be avoiding any deep dives into the regional debate for now, but what we can see is this. The fallout from the Celtic Warriors can be felt to this very day, and continues to serve as a warning of how the pro game in Wales can go if not managed correctly. And that's our recap on the Celtic Warriors. If you've enjoyed listening to this video story, a like on this video would be greatly appreciated. And if you want to see more, give us a subscribe. I've been Benny from Catch22 Rugby, and we'll see you in the next one.